responsibility. Because remember, that's what we are talking about. We are talking about citizens who want to demand and the middlemen who say, we will do it for you. What is the problem with the middlemen? The middlemen have a number of problems. And they, some of these are problems which you can say apply to middlemen, even the, the, the real estate agents and others. Uh, the, it, it's perhaps a general doba doba problem, perhaps. One is inefficiency. Inefficiency. You are lengthening the chain of accountability. Because you, you, you have, when you have a, the citizen has to go through this person, this person has to go through there, there. So in terms of the time and cost, so if uh, citizens in uh, a village here are demanding a change in the way the, the local magistrate's court is being run, there's a difference between those citizens marching to the court and demanding to see the clerk and saying we want A, B, C, D, E done, uh, between that and a situation where the citizens are approached by an NGO which then takes statements and then the NGO contacts its headquarters in Blantai or Lirongwe and says we have an issue here in Chirazulu uh, and there perhaps they say well but we need funding uh, how are we going to travel there and then forms are filled etc. You get the story. Having a middle person lengthens the process, increases the cost. Second is what I would call mixed agendas. Mixed agendas. As long as you have a middle person or middleman, they, are, they, they, they will also have their own agenda. And so NGOs and others uh, which uh, are fighting for accountability and good governance, they will also have their own agendas. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, they are institutions, and institutions have agendas. The trouble comes when this agenda may not necessarily align with the gender agenda of the person who is demanding. So again, we could elaborate that, but I think because a lot of these are analogies from uh, the economic market, I think we are quite familiar with what I'm talking about here. So um, if, for example, I have an NGO uh, which says I work for judicial independence and accountability, and you say, please, can you go and say we want the chief justice to resign? And let's suppose I am the Malawi Law Society. So the Blantyre people are saying, you, chair of Law Society, go and demand that the Chief Justice should resign. And I say, ah, yeah. I look at my diary and I have a case before the Chief Justice on Friday. These people are saying, Wednesday, go and demand. Point number three. is what I call the lost in translation problem. The lost in translation problem. I'm sure you have played this game where, I, I don't know, if you haven't played it, it's a very interesting one. If six of you, a line, six of you, somebody whispers, and somebody whispers, I don't, you have played this game? Yes. So you know the point, you get it. That's the point. The middleman, <laughs> you tell the middleman, go and tell him to resign. We don't like what he's doing. He's rubbish. That's the language the people have used. Because the people have very little to lose. Uh, that's rubbish. Tell him to step down now or come and stone him. And uh, tomorrow we read the press release. From the... He's expressing reservations in the manner in which this office is being discharged <laughs> and would therefore be appreciative of any considerations towards relinquishing <laughs> the... You know, sometimes middlemen can take out the bite. The, I call this the lost in translation problem. And then there is the dependence syndrome which we are all aware of. Sometimes you can become too dependent on middlemen. I'm sure that uh, those of us in the room who have played this role one way or the other uh, 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 get this. I can almost share a little personal story myself. I retired, as you heard, and therefore I'm less active in uh, engaging in public debate and so on. And one of the constant questions I, I get is, Masukwa no simu kuyangu ratu? Simu kutiyangu rira ya, ratso gorele. <laughs> That's so good, <laughs> 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 
Um, yeah, the expectation that some, somehow I am a citizen, but there is someone else who will do this citizen thing for me. Uh, it, it goes beyond judicial accountability. A lot of what I'm saying here are, in fact, just, uh, they, they manifest themselves with respect to judicial accountability, but it's a general problem with democratic governance and the demand side. So the other problem with the middleman is the dependence syndrome. And you know when you have a dependence syndrome, uh, it, it's, it, 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 it can be hard. And let me just as a little footnote say, dependence is bad, but they are beneficiaries. They will always be beneficiaries. And that is why we have to ask ourselves, and I think this is a, a question we have to ask ourselves honestly and have candid answers. From, we started by noting that we have had this constitution for 30 years. For the past 30 years, a lot of NGOs and others, and as I said, a lot of them are well-meaning, but they have been going out into the field. One of the themes has been to educate and you know the word that's going to follow. The masses. Educate the masses. Empower. 30 years. Why are they not yet empowered? Why, after 30 years of these projects, why are the people not civic educated? Could it be, and I make no judgment, I ask this, sincerely as a question for reflection by us and by everybody else, could it be that it is possible to perpetuate dependence? This argument has been made, for example, in terms of international finance, where other people have said, well, the international capitalist world would like to keep countries in a situation of dependence so that no matter how long, so when a country shows that it may actually be breaking out and about to become completely independent, you find ways of making sure. So could it be that there are vested interests in perpetuating dependence in the governance field in which we are operating now? Could this not just be a problem of the demand side, but could it be a problem that is being funded by the self-interested middleman? So, again, I want to emphasize, I don't see that, I, I'm not arguing that there is anything inherently bad about middlemen. I'm not even arguing that uh, it is completely possible to throw them away. I think they have their own benefits. I already demonstrated how perhaps over the years uh, they became useful, particularly while when the population was still kind of learning the ropes of this constitution and the democratization and so on. So there is a place, I suppose, for the middleman. And you might say, therefore, well, let's revise the title from cutting out to cutting back. So I'm quite prepared to compromise on that. But we cannot run away from the fact that unless we cut, out, cut, cut off or cut back the middleman, we are not going to achieve sustainable constitutionalism. Sustainable constitutionalism, a situation where a country develops a culture of uh, relying on constitutional principles, uh, human rights, rule of law, etc. that is not attainable only by work on the supply side. Unless we take serious look at the demand side and tackle the structural and other problems that limit the capacity of the demand side to achieve, we will perpetually be in a situation where governance under the constitution that we mentioned is merely an illusion, where the principles that we stated earlier are not foundational principles, but rather uh, aspirations that we will never attain. So to, to avoid that, we need to strengthen citizen action. We need to strengthen citizen action. I've already explained why the middleman has problems, although it's a kind of... So let, let's put it this way, because I'm, I'm, as I speak, I still am thinking about this. Do we cut out the middleman completely? Do we keep him? Uh, do we, and now, just two minutes ago, I began to think, well, maybe this middleman is like a troublesome child. What do you do as a parent when you have a really, really unruly child? Well, I guess you can cut them off. Here's a suitcase, here are your things, go. Or you could say, well, 
you'll be with us, but this is what we are going to do. So maybe, maybe that's where we are now. Um, but what's important for me is the enhancement of citizen direct action because of the problems that are evident in over-reliance on the middleman. So when it comes to the demand side and citizen action, direct action, how can we, how can we attend that and how, how do we begin because it's a journey, it cannot be achieved overnight. I mean, a, a, a country where for more than 30 years, uh, people were conditioned to a dictatorship, a one-party state, where accountability was almost non-existent. To wake up people from that, I don't know, maybe it takes more than 30 years. So if you've been sleeping for 30 years, maybe it takes more than 30 years to, to kind of uh, wake up from it. So it, it's a lot of work to be done on the demand side. But, as I said earlier, there has been a start. A number of these uh, middlemen who we are now having a problem with have done a good job, as I said earlier. Uh, civic education, uh, the data shows, for example, that awareness of the constitution, awareness of laws, and so on, has improved over time. So people have become more aware and, and, and uh, perhaps uh, a little more literate. Social media has helped. Everybody is a lawyer. Everybody can understand. Uh, you, you don't have to go to law school to be a lawyer, quite frankly. Uh, two hours a day on Facebook, I think, is enough. Uh, uh, you, 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 you could actually grasp the, 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 the rudiments of law. <laughs> Why pay more uh, at a university to study law? Uh, you are studying law, yes? Okay, I, I have a cheaper alternative, <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> but on a serious note, I think that we're, what we're saying is that the demand side, the problems on the demand side are extensive. They are consequential. This is not to suggest that there are no problems on the supply side. There are problems. I've already outlined some of them. Many of them are structural, and I want to emphasize that, structural. Because there is a tendency in some quarters to personalize and to say, well, the reason why the judiciary is, in, is problematic is because of that judge and that judge and that judge. Well, maybe, but uh, it, it's actually more fundamental to think about the structural uh, problems. Because structural problems last. People die, people resign, people retire, but structural problems last. So I think that's where the uh, focus ought to be. A, a lot of work has been done there, but as I said, it's the demand side that we wish to talk about, perhaps, or rather we have uh, mentioned a lot more this afternoon. So how do we approach enhancing direct citizenship, and uh, by especially uh, in terms of uh, trying to move away from middlemen? Well, I think the way to approach it is this, that to think of the middleman as a current necessary evil, if you will. A current necessary evil. Evil in the sense that I'm not, not evil like, hey, horns and devil and so on. But evil in the sense that they have their challenges. They present impediments. But at the same time, I think we cannot cut them out to, just like that. I mean, today, uh, to say tomorrow, no middlemen. Some of the middlemen, by the way, would be quite happy. I know, for example, maybe in the Malay Law Society sometimes does feel a little pressured into acting by public, etc. So middlemen would not necessarily complain about being allowed to go about their own business. But what do we do, I mean, in the meantime, to ensure that we don't have to rely on middlemen for the rest of our democratic lives? if you will. I think the first and, uh, and most important thing is obviously awareness. Not general awareness that there is democracy, there are courts, but awareness that becomes more and more particular. Awareness of the detailed ma uh, landscape of judicial accountability. Citizens must know. Without knowledge, how can you be empowered to act to take direct action. And unfortunately, in this manner, in this matter, very few uh, efforts are made, even by citizens who ought to know better. We make very little effort to understand and know the landscape of judicial accountability, but are quick to condemn the judiciary for lack of accountability. I want to repeat that because it's quite, it's quite a hobby, especially on social media and so on, to knock the judiciary at every first opportunity. 
And I, I have nothing against knocking anyone. I mean, I believe in freedom of expression, freedom of opinion, but I think it helps if your opinion or expression is backed by facts and knowledge. Unfortunately, many of us have not made the effort to understand the landscape of judicial accountability. Because unless we, if we don't do that, then how can we be, take more action, direct action? So let me try this. Uh, I have 10 more minutes, I think. Let me try this this afternoon in this room. Because this room is the one that one would say is fair, full, uh, has people who are knowledgeable about the law. Knowledgeable. Therefore, if you don't know, what is the chance of that guy at Intopa? <laughs> so let's go then. I, I'm afraid, I mean, you, you can't avoid it. It was called a lecture, so we expected a question or two. At this point, if it was in a classroom, this is the point at which you pretend to write. <laughs> so, that, so that you don't get pointed at. I will not point at anyone. I will just ask a general question. So don't pretend to write. How many of us, okay, I mentioned it, so I will skip that. Judicial Service Commission, I will skip that. I will simply ask, please take note, not for my purposes, but for your own purposes of reflection later. Do you know the Judicial Service, do you know the Judicial Service Commission? Probably the answer, yes. You, you, you read the law and so on. Do you know its composition? When I said its composition is mostly lawyers, did your mind say, yeah, of course, there is that, 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 that who sits on that committee. Do you know? Or sh will you have to check after this lecture? Ask yourself. I, 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 how many of us in this room know about the Judicial Integrity Committee? Uh, write the question, no answers, just questions. Judicial Integrity Committee and its functions. How many of us know about court users committees and their functions and membership? and what role they play in judicial accountability. And I'm asking this deliberately because whether we are law students, law scholars, practicing lawyers, we are citizens first. And unless we take an interest in our citizenship and the rights that we have, I think we are almost not entitled to go on on this sprees of constitutional vandalism that happen on social media and other places. I call it constitutional vandalism because that's exactly what sometimes happens. If you just throw stones and break down institutions without facts and you, you walk away without consequences, I think that is constitutional vandalism. Burglary even. <laughs> because basically what you're doing is you're entering the constitution with an intent to commit vandalism. <laughs> with an intent to commit vandalism in there. And then you go. Knowledge. Knowledge enables us to approach this serious subject seriously, to have a chance of addressing this, one of the most critical questions that we have in front of us, because it relates to foundational principles of the Constitution. We ought to take it a little more seriously. How do we take it a little more seriously? By becoming more knowledgeable about it in the same way in which a lot of us are knowledgeable about the executive, or the president, or the SPC, or the SPC has done that, or the PS, or director, uh, and so on, or there is the, the Malawi public service, uh, uh, or, you know, parliament committees, why don't we also take the same interest? And it's not just for us. What I said is that it's almost a precondition. Unless this happens, across the country, at all levels, unless we get more and more knowledge about what is judicial accountability and what tools are, do we have as citizens. We'll never be able to use those tools. You can't use tools unless you know they are there. Once we get knowledge, we move to action because I think it is not enough. I think one of the problems uh, that has faced the Consolidation of Democracy Project in Malawi is Limited citizen action. Active citizenship is extremely limited, even among those who ought to know better. We see this every day. When an issue arises which requires direct citizen action, many of us would rather not participate. And here, I am talking about 
for example, at least uh, three steps that I would see as being critical to moving to action now. One would be to have an honest conversation with the middlemen about what I would call exit strategies. Let citizens meet, whether you are talking about NGOs like Malay Law Society or indeed community-based organizations at the local level or some of these NGOs that travel around the country. I think communities have now matured enough to have a conversation with them and say, look, you have been working in this area since 1994 to empower us. Let's have a chat. When are we going to be empowered? so that you can live and go maybe somewhere else. Now, I am making this sound a little flippant. It is not. It is a conversation that must be had because a democracy cannot really take roots simply by being a vicarious democracy where citizens leave their citizenship or, uh, through others. Citizens must leave their citizenship themselves direct and say strategy that is meant to have a smooth transition because this is not conflict at all. It's simply saying we as citizens think that we now are at a point when we can move faster, we can get better results in our demanding accountability if we find a kind of a, a, a way uh, of removing you. <laughs> I don't know what the most uh, diplomatic way of saying that would be. But exit strategy. Honest discussions about exit strategy. Number two is, we've already talked about knowledge, so we are now talking about mobilizing for specific action. Now, to say, right, what are the problems that we have? Uh, how do we deal with them and so on? Now, I, I know that as I say this, some of you are wondering, what does the villager have to do? I mean, how will this affect the Chief Justice? I think let's think of accountability, not just in terms of the, uh, the Supreme Court and High Court. In fact, I think it would be a mistake to do that, to focus on the High Court and Supreme Court as the locus of our discussion of accountability. I think the accountability, judicial accountability, in fact, is in more danger and at more risk in more isolated areas. Let's imagine a magistrate, for example, who is kilometers away from anybody else, kilometers away from the bomber. I think that judicial officer can almost do anything with very limited accountability if the citizens around that court if the citizens who use this court do not take action. And that's why I'm saying citizen action is important because the middlemen may not even arrive, may, they may, that may be out of bounds or out of reach of the middlemen. Mobilizing for specific action, therefore, doesn't mean action against the Chief Justice or Supreme Court, although that may be included. But I'm talking about action with respect to accountability of local courts. The courts that are in our midst, the nearest to us, the nearest to the citizens. Now, how can we mobilize? You might say, oh, but there have been arguments in some literature that uh, Malawian society was demobilized through the one-party state, that they are no longer capable of mobilizing themselves for action. I, I tend to disagree uh, with that conclu pessimistic conclusion. I think it's clear that Malawians, when they set their mind to it, can actually mobilize and organize. What about, how do we organize around religion, for example? I'm a Catholic. I mean, I, 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 I maybe I should have stated that at the beginning as a declaration of interest. Um, but we have Mpakati. Every Catholic in Malawi belongs to Mpakati. I don't know how many millions of people that is, who are already in setups, in committees across the country, urban, rural, north, south, center. There are many of such community structures which can be used, maybe used is the wrong term because it suggests an external force, but which citizens can use to expand and begin to discuss other things that affect their own lives, including the work of the judiciary. Accountability is not just about wondering, ah, the MP Sakuti Tandiza, ah, Councillor Sakuti Tandiza. We should also be able to say, Magistrate Sakuti Tandiza.
But we cannot wait for the Mama you lost society to always uh, go to the street and say, ah, you know, cases are being delayed. The people who experience delayed cases are not the Mama you lost society, but individuals. And it's not just this big name to be here, but the ordinary citizen who has had their own case on the bicycle and so on, which has been dragging for years. So I think mobilization is possible because some of the structures already exist. They need to be animators within the communities where you can set it up and begin uh, the process. Now, this is uh, always the difficult part. Uh, I don't know whether it's because of the result of our culture, but you know what happens to you when you begin to are the first one to suggest radical action. For example, a demonstration. People say, I can't get it. an insult. There are people with voice in the village. There are people with power. There are animators in the village. Perhaps with a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of discussion, citizens can become their own masters, if you will, and but also from all holders of public power. And therefore, I conclude this lecture by saying the following. Judicial accountability is extremely critical to the sustenance of democracy in Malawi and indeed elsewhere. Uh, judicial accountability is the currency with which the judiciary secures public confidence. The more accountable an institution is, the more confidence it will win from the public. And the judiciary relies on public confidence to sustain its legitimacy. Historically, and for understandable reasons, the accountability equation, the demand supply accountability equation in Malawi has been facilitated by what we may call middlemen who have in fact, registered some benefits and some gains in the process of consolidating democracy. However, middlemen come with their own baggage, and we have already outlined this. And it's baggage which disables them from having the capacity to be the long-term uh, factor that can help consolidation of democracy. So we can only see them perhaps as a necessary temporary measure. Although 30 years is a long time, but I think, I think that that's now quite a long time. In the absence, no, rather not in the absence, but in order to move forward, we need as a minimum to reduce the role of middlemen, but at best to remove it altogether so that there is a direct connection between citizens and their governors. Now you might say, 
this is not practical. Not every citizen, uh, we are 17 million people, cannot go to knocking on offices demanding accountability. I have said it's, this must be through organizing. Organizing by implication suggests that all these questions will be uh, of form and methods and, uh, and approaches will be discussed. But what is critical, I think, is this. To sustain constitutionalism in Malawi, to have a culture where power is exercised on the basis of the fundamental principles I outlined earlier, citizens have to jump into the ring themselves. If they don't do this, then we shall perpetually be in this situation where we are engaged in what I call citizenship by proxy or proxy citizenship, where we abdicate our citizenship to others to take care of us, and we just sit and expect that the benefits and the bounty of democratization will flow to us. I'm afraid we have... There must be hard work.
Georgia, that uh, the, the vanguard will become the middleman. But, but then again, I mean, the, there's a structural difference, a fundamental structural difference. The, the vanguard I'm talking about is a member of the community. It's almost like a condition. You have to be a member of that community. Otherwise, then what's the point? Now, if you are a member of that community, uh, you, you can, yes, there's a risk you could become a middleman, but then remember that communities have their own other mechanisms of ensuring that people do not become a kind of uh, dangerous middleman. I think we have seen the issue of uh, village headmen, for example, during AIP. We have seen citizens turn against them. Once they begin to depart from the interests of their people, the, the people themselves can turn against, against them. So I think that, yes, there is a risk, but I think that it's a, there's a fundamental difference. The middleman I'm thinking about, okay, think about it almost as an outsider. He, he's not part of the community. He's coming in, he, that's, why, that is, that's why there is a distance. So yes, I recognize there is a, there is a risk. I recognize that there is a risk. I mean, we have seen uh, student leaders uh, evolve into members of the administration. Uh, I'm not, I, 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 as a student myself, I know this from, from, from experience. So there's always that risk, but a lot of it depends on the strength of the community itself. If you have a strong, empowered community, it will cut off that person and, and at some point say, no, you are now a middleman. You are no longer part of us. So we'll get rid of you, we'll get another one. So I think in a sense, it's not neat but that's the answer. The answer is that fundamentally, this person, when, if they become the middleman, they cannot, you cannot be a middleman and at the same time be a member of the community. I think conceptually, that's what I'm saying. You, 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 you shouldn't. I think that was uh, um, connected to that. Was there an, an additional question there that I missed? Because I was taking notes as you finished. Will the vanguard not become the middleman? Well, the answer is no, in my view. Uh, there's a risk, but the answer is no. But also, in addition, communities have mechanisms of ensuring that when their members begin to detach and take on the interests of others, communities can deal with that. I mean, I can only speak from the community with which I've been familiar, as I said, a student body. I mean, you can take that as a good example where uh, the, the students elect a leader and they say, well, you are one of us. But when they go to the administration, the administration says, no, you are our bridge to the students. Now, if you say, ah, yes, I am a bridge, then you are no longer a student leader. You are a bridge. Uh, and then at some point, people will say, ah, no, I think in that case, then uh, perhaps of the high court. Who, who has the power to remove judges of the high court? Uh, these are law students. <laughs> uh, Yeah, there. I should not move. I should I, here, right? Okay. Um, so, so yeah, yeah. You're you're right. I mean, knowledge is hard to get. But what I'm saying is that there are mechanisms, and maybe we should also uh, uh, think about the society and, and how it has evolved. This point I make maybe in one line in the actual detailed paper. That I think for now it's almost. I don't know, I'm guessing, but it's almost impossible to find a village where there is no one who has gone up to Form 4. Indeed, as more and more universities arise and more and more people study, I think our societies are evolving. So I think to some extent we should be rather cautious of our characterization of the lack of knowledge and flow of knowledge within the community. But having said that, I agree. There are situations where 
you, 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 you need, and that's why partly maybe I agree, I think was it the idea, or I don't know where it came from, it says maybe it's too early to completely cut off the middleman. I, I, yeah, I think you're right in that sense. But I, let's be honest that you cannot have this position as a permanent position. That's really ultimately the goal. So, yes, Uh, uh, that is a astounding <laughs> conclusion. I, uh, they, they also have religious views and so Uh, saying, uh, I think a judge, they were, they were even calling them, they were calling a certain judge, says, ah, a democratic judge uh, decided this, and some, a Republican judge. Now, that's a question whether that's where we want to be, because in the U.S., some of them, they will campaign under political party banner. Uh, choose me to be judge so, so. Uh, no, I think they're talking about DAs, but judges also campaign. Basically, you know, these are conservative, these are liberal. So to, for, to say, oh, uh, they will be campaigning at CU today, saying, choose me, I'll be the best judge. Now, I know why we react like this. Partly it's traditional, because we, our legal system has been developed from the British tradition of law and judges. It's, a, it's kind of a gentleman's game. You know, you don't apply for these jobs. You don't uh, do interviews. You just whisper and say, so-so is a good gentleman. Uh, and so on. And these things happen that way, and you... But maybe things have changed, so we may have to start debating this more seriously. But I'm not too sure that we are yet at because we st probably we still are messing up our parliamentary and presidential elections. Maybe we should wait, <laughs> sort that out first, and then before introducing that mess uh, in the, in the in the judiciary. Um, so I, again, I, again, sorry for keeping you waiting further, but. I think how enabling is the constitution? I think two, two quick answers. One, it is enabling. There's also a couple of paragraphs in the paper. Human rights are the most enabling uh, because the human rights section, chapter four, is the one that allows even this man from Monsoni to do certain things. You don't have to have a degree or whatever to do certain things. So in terms of enabling tools, human rights are. The only problem is that you still need, it's not just a question of having tools. You need the courage and others. That's where I said organizing comes in. There is uh, safety and confidence in numbers. While individual villagers may not go to a court to complain, but if they meet in the evening chat and say, yeah, I think they can actually do it. So human rights are one. Will they still be going through the middleman? You mentioned the ombudsman. You said some of the, the middlemen are, in fact, uh, uh, in the constitution. 
Yes and no. No in the sense that, and that's why perhaps we didn't have time to flesh out conceptually what a middleman is. But I wouldn't put constitutional bodies such as the ombudsman, etc., in this class uh, of middlemen that I'm talking about. Although MPs occupy a bit of a curious place because to some extent they are middlemen, to some extent they're also part of the community. Uh, so I think we can explore that a little further. But in terms of just do citizens have the tools? Uh, does the constitution enable them? Yes, it does. And I think the starting point is the human rights section. But as we said, exercise of human rights, the fact that you have a right doesn't mean you are going to exercise it. How many of us have ever been in a demonstration, a street demonstration, for example, during the elections? Uh, one way or the other, whether you were supporting this side or this side, how many of you have, and I really don't want to, to make this a kind of uh, serious point, but how many of us, when we hear there is a demonstration tomorrow in Blantyre, our, our instinct is, eh, hey, this is the wrong town here.
think I can answer it. Okay, let me start with that one. I, I, there's a difference. There's a difference between uh, debate and vandalism. I think that's why, for example, in a lecture room, even here, that's why he's saying, "Let's take three, and then you answer, and then that's why in court, you have procedures. Uh, you a witness speaks, another does. It's that sense of debate. It's not to curtail any aspect of debate." You can provoke debate anyhow. But vandalism is where there is no method. It's pure madness without objective. Or the only objective that is there is to annoy and irritate. So social media, unfortunately, is such a broad term because within it we have to separate. It's not all social media that is vandalism. And if that's what I suggested, I, 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 I retract. I, I didn't say that. But that's where you find a lot of it. Why do you find a lot of it? It's because there's no responsibility. Uh, in vandalism, you can just go walk around here and throw stones at the glasses and walk all the way, no consequences. I think social media to some extent allows you to do that. As long as you have data, you don't even have to have data. You, you, you just have to be near edu room. If you're near edu room and you have a bit of time, then you can just go and say, the chief justice is corrupt. That's what I'm saying. That's vandalism. How does that assist anyone. I mean, you have no, you have no evidence uh, that the chief justice, the Malay Law Society, all lawyers are thieves. Are they? And so on. So, yes, there is an element in which uh, but if the whole village is Amisala, then uh, you can't win in Hondo. <laughs> you can't. So, I, I agree. Social media is a useful tool. In fact, I would almost go as far as saying the development of social media has accelerated the debate on judicial accountability because it allows almost every case that's decided, it's there, tomorrow people are debating it. So there is a line of constructive debate and, and, and so on. But there is another nasty element. You will agree with me, social media has a certain nasty, nasty element. And the fact that people can say things without even disclosing their identity. So you could be sitting here with somebody in this very lecture room and then go and insult them on social media without them knowing that you are the one. I mean, that's a kind of, uh, uh, I would almost call it wild west uh, environment, which I, I am. So no, I didn't want to dismiss social media entirely. It is a useful source of debate, public debate. It's just that sometimes is, uh, but also something you said, I think maybe just needs a little comment, which you said, yeah, but social media represents the views of the general public. I, I think we need to be cautious about that statement. One, they are very, very, out of the 17 million Malawians, I, I'm not even sure how many are on WhatsApp or Facebook or Twitter. So again, it's not always just a question of numbers because the people who are on social media are very influential qualitatively. So we shouldn't suggest that because it's small number, it doesn't matter. But it's important to remember that there are a lot of debates in Malawi on public issues that happen outside of social media. Ma millions of Malawians today have debated many, many issues without having access to the phone or laptop or anything. Minibus, minibus is another good place where debates happen, uh, sometimes even more logical than uh, some of the vandalism that I was talking about. Um, language, uh, your question is the easiest because the answer is yes. I, I agree with you. I, I think that language in this country is one of the uh, most downplayed aspects of the obstacles to democratization, not just in the courts, in parliament, in all these documents. I think we almost have two countries here. We have the countries of the English speaking, and then we have the country of the non-English speaking. I sometimes joke that if you are to go and attend a, a case, there are two cases happening, one in English, one in Chichewa, and sometimes they are not the same. And I think, again, a note to legal scholars, deep research is required there. To what extent does the fact that language interpretation, court interpretation, to what extent does it affect the right to fair trial? I've already given you a title there. <laughs> Dissertation, journal paper, and so on. Because I think if you ob observe even just 10 cases, go to 10 cases, take notes, take the English version, and then take the interpreter's version, and then do a proper analysis of, does this mean this? 
Now, the, the danger is that the guy who is maybe, or the, the lady or whatever sitting in the, in the dock can only listen one language. So he's participating in this trial. The magistrate usually participates in both. That's why sometimes he corrects. I says, no, 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 no. It was showing that there are two things going on here. Now, if you have a foreign observer, they will only watch one trial, the English one. So, yes, that's the shortest answer for you. <laughs> and then finally, finally, uh, I think it was uh, demonstrations, such a rumble, demonstrations. How can we make sure demonstrations are effective? I think let me start by kind of uh, uh, challenging you on the point that a demonstration cannot be effective unless it is violent. I have participated in many demonstrations myself as a young man and even older. And it depends how you organize it. I, I actually think that using, using violence as a means of gaining, I, I think it's a lazy way of demonstrating. Because anybody, any fool can pick a stone and throw at a glass. But it takes thinking to think of how can we best demonstrate to have an impact. And that, I think, has to do with vanguard, leadership, and so on. I'm sure that uh, I will finish by pointing to you, because I always encourage law students, so this is to the law students, read the news every single day. Watch the news. Don't go to bed without knowing what's going on in the world. If you have a phone, it's not just for WhatsApp. Have a news app on your phone. And you can even uh, tell your phone, these phones are smart now. You can say, tell me legal news from the world. And they will tell you. I say this, for example, because uh, Mr. Chirambo's question about, right now in Israel, uh, one way of doing, let me quickly share my experience from demonstrations in the past. The longer you keep a demonstration, the more effective it has, even if you are peaceful. Because it begins to affect people's lives. So you don't have to stone anyone, you can just sit there. Israel right now, they are in the fourth month, if not fifth, of a demonstration. A demonstration that has been going on, this is the fifth month now. And I mention it because it has to do with the judiciary. The citizenry, general citizenry, are demonstrating because they feel the executive is trying to undermine judicial independence. Thousands of citizens are going to the streets every single day to demonstrate on this. Now, I think it's having an effect already. You can see the government shifting there and shifting there. But part of the reason why I think they have succeeded is the length of time. I'm not even sure. In Malawi, some of the longest demonstrations are what? Five hours? <laughs> Three hours. <laughs> Israel is doing that. France, in France, there are demonstrations about the pension law. I think this is the fourth month or fifth month of it. Day every single day. So, in a sense, I think that, but what can the law do to make this more effective? I, I think that was your question. And I don't have a quick answer to that. Because here is where you balance. And the problem with demonstrations is, often it is not the demonstrators themselves who become violent, but they are opportunists who sometimes enter. Now, you need to separate, because then if it is just criminals jumping on board, you cannot blame demonstration. It, you, can, you blame these ones. But maybe uh, the way the police sometimes react as well, if you say we want to demonstrate, oh no, you want, oh no, you want, oh, you go injunction. I think by the time people are demonstrating, things have been wound up already. So maybe that's the problem. I'm sorry to give such a, a wide ranging and scatterbrained random uh, set of answers, but I hope it has added a little bit to what I, I was hoping, as a minimum, I was hoping we would have today. It's simply to trigger your reflection. It's not an academic lecture in the sense that I have given you, you know, the A's and B's and keys and so on. But I think, I hope that tonight, I have, or this afternoon, I have given you sufficient material on which you can begin to reflect uh, on questions of judicial accountability, citizen action, the middlemen, most importantly, constitutionalism. But indeed, perhaps, to be very practical, I also hope that this has also enabled to give you a bit of ideas about writing and research and so on. If we have done that, then I'm, I, I would say we have achieved what we came for. Once again, Dean, thank you. Uh, director, thank you. Everybody who, who is here, thank you. Especially the students and staff who are in another seminar. So you have had a long, long, tiring day, but you have been here. I, I don't take it for granted at all. I really thank you most sincerely.
Thank you very much, Prof, for that enlightening lecture. Uh, Prof taught me some 36 years ago. We, we, were, we were his first students as he was beginning his uh, teaching career. And we have observed over time how he has grown and uh, imparted to almost all the lawyers that, that you see in the country. And so thankful for that and that you were able to come as we requested. And also I'm glad to see how active our students have been. I know you, you, you quipped, but I think you were joking whether they were law students. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm really impressed with uh, uh, your response, uh, the questions you have asked. Maybe we didn't have enough time, uh, but I think we should do this more uh, than we have been so far. And uh, Prof, as you go back to Zomba, we hope that you will take up the uh, request that we have made and <laughs> you can uh, come and uh, speak to these students a little more regularly. Uh, that will be very much appreciated. To the research and publications uh, group, you have done a wonderful job to bring us together, the notices that you put out, and the whole organization. And uh, the director for academic affairs, thank you for being with us. Uh, it is uh, my humble uh, prayer that we will continue to engage uh, as a faculty. It's, it's really enlightening. Thank you very much. So with these few remarks, uh, this session is closed. Uh, and remember to go and check on legal news. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I'm sure the lecture has also given you uh, topics for your dissertations and so I think it's very helpful thank you